Good morning. My name is Jerry Alderman. Uh, I am the CEO of Valkyrie. Um, I, I, when I come to these sort of events, I always think to myself, so what's the big news? I mean, what is it that I really have to share? Um, it's not about my company. Uh, you know, the chances are none of you will ever use the stuff that I make. Uh, I, I think the big news uh, in B2B marketing is that finally B2B marketing is important. Uh, I've been in B2B marketing my entire life, uh, between marketing and sales. I ran sales and marketing for a Fortune 500 company. Uh, ten years uh, after that, I consulted with some of the who's who of companies in, in the country. Uh, now I've been making tools for B2B marketing for five years. Uh, and throughout that entire time, uh, B2B marketers, uh, for most of the most of that time, were sort of persona non grata. I mean, it was, they, they didn't have much of a budget. Uh, you know, the tenure of a, of a BDB marketer or a CMO was not long. Uh, and that's all changing. And so I think the big news in, in B2B is that marketing is finally getting a seat at the table. And I reflect on that and ask myself, why is that? Why, why, why in my tenure through the, the 30 years I've been working in, in B2B marketing and sales, why is it that just now is B2B marketing truly getting a seat at the table? Uh, I work with Beth Comstock, the CMO of GE. She actually presented much of what we do to their board of directors a few months ago. And what surprised me about that was that it was the first time she had the opportunity to present to her board of directors. You know, her board of directors up until that point, really saw her more as a cost center, someone that spent money on advertising, someone that spent money on communications. But for the first time, they wanted to listen to her, and the reason they wanted to listen to her is because B2B marketing within GE is finally having an impact on demand. It's having an impact on their actual business, on their profitability. And so I asked myself, so why is that? So when I think about the, the markets that we all participate in, I, I think about it as a system. Um, I think about B2B, which is sort of reflected as, here's a big, large company. It has thousands of employees doing a lot of work. And then here's another company that they serve. Oftentimes, it's another large company that has thousands of employees that's doing a lot of work. Um, and when you think about that system, right? Um, the work within these companies is, is speeding up. It's speeding up. The pace of innovation, the pace of competition, the competition that most of us face from the globe, whether it be Indonesia, Brazil, China, you name it. The pace of competition is speeding up. Everything's speeding up. Uh, we've got LinkedIn, we have Twitter, we have all, just all of these things are speeding up the pace of business. And when you look at that system between these two companies and look at the interface between them, it continues to be rather old fashioned for B2B. The interface between these companies continues to be the salesperson. The sale, a salesperson. A salesperson, and, we re, and we're more and more trying to rely on that salesperson to funnel all the necessary communication, information through this tiny little node to enable us to do business at the speed that's expected. And it's not happening very well. It's not happening very well. We're trying to make that salesperson more efficient. Uh, we're giving them more and more CRM tools, better, better CRM tools. We're handing, we're throwing Twitter at them. We're, we're throwing all kinds of things at them that we think is going to make the system more efficient. But my point of view, and I think the reason why marketing is becoming important is because I think we've just about wrong every drop of efficiency we can get out of that salesperson, out of that little node that exists between our giant B2B corporations. And what's happening in the marketplace is that marketing is becoming more important because marketing has to play a more important role between a company and its customers like never before. It's actually becoming important. And I think, it's, I think it's fundamentally the step function, the transformation that we're going through, that instead of just relying on that node of a salesperson between company and customer, 
that marketing is actually, instead of trying to fix, I was just at the, I, the Institute for the Study of Business Markets where Gary Slack and a lot of your BMA board members and, and fancy people like Fred Wiersma all think big thoughts. And, and one of the questions they're still addressing is we need to fix the fracture, or we need to improve the relationship between sales and market. Um, in many ways, I, I think that's the wrong, the wrong solution. I think what we need to focus on is not so much fixing the relationship between sales and marketing, but bringing marketing in between a company and its customers in a real role. And that real role has to involve things like helping a company increase the pace of innovation, helping a company figure out how to win share with its customers, helping a company figure out how to literally help it win new customers. So there's this, this system that's evolving that's literally giving marketing a seat at the table. And it's being driven by the speed of business. It's all about speed. So my big message to you, and maybe you, maybe, maybe you do or don't see this, but, but I see it, is, is to step up and take your seat at the table because it's there, it's, ha it's happening. So as you listen to all the folks here today sharing their stories with you, I would, I would just ask you to put it in, in the context of there are big opportunities in this world for B2B marketing. It's a great place to be. We at Valkyrie play a small role in this. I'm gonna share a few things with you. Uh, uh, what I would hope that you would take away from what I'm about to share is that all we're doing is, try, is trying in a small way to enable marketers to win and keep that seat at the table and be more efficient and help their companies you know, increase share with customers, et cetera. So, this is a, for, how many of you know the ISBM? Raise your hand. It's called the Institute for the Study of Business Markets. Uh, I, 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 I participate in two big um, sort of gatherings or communities. One is Business Marketing Association. Um, I think of the Business Marketing Association as where uh, it's kind of a rah-rah association, it's, it's where we have fun, it's where it, it, it does all the things that we were just talking about, it creates community and all that. The ISBM is, is pretty academic, it's, you know, like I said, it's where big thinkers think big thoughts. Um, and I don't mean that in a disparaging way, uh, but it's, it's more research oriented. Every two years, uh, they do a study, uh, and so there's about a hundred of the largest B2B companies in the world that participate in ISBM. Same all as Motorola and GE and HP, et cetera. Every two years they conduct a study about what's the number one thing on the minds of CEOs of B2B companies, chief marketing officers, chief sales officers, et cetera. And so the number one thing on the mind of those people is on the sport. It's one, we need to figure out how to more effectively quantify and communicate value created for customers. We need to, that doesn't work very well. We need to develop better approaches to understand what customers really need. We need to find sense, identify and assess new opportunities for growth. That's all marketing stuff. I, lo I love that, I love that. I mean, the number one thing on the minds of CEOs and, and others is to figure out how to better leverage their marketing function to help with those ideas. Um, before I cover any of this. I, I think it's funny that when you talk to, the, to customers of companies and you ask them what they want from their suppliers. Um, so I, I live most of my, my, most of my time is spent with customers of companies. Uh, and if you ask them what they want from their supplier, most of the time they'll tell you two things. Number one, is they want to feel like their supplier understands their business and is helping them solve problems. And number two, is they would like to feel comfortable that the investments that their supplier is making is aligned with the problems that the company is going to have in the future. So at the core of it, it's all about understanding one another and solving problems together. And I, and I always reflect on that when I look at this because there's such a great sort of alignment of interests, right? Companies want 
to better understand and quantify the value and or how are they helping their customers solve problems. They want to do that with better speed. Customers want the same thing. It's a matter of how do we connect that fabric better, right? And it kind of circles back to what I started with is the way to connect it better is not trying to figure out the next level of making that salesperson more efficient. The way to connect it better is to get marketing more directly involved, okay? So Valkyrie, um, look, we, we, we have uh, a system that's comprised of a metric method and software. I'll tell you a little bit about it. Uh, it's been significantly built um, with uh, Owens Corning and General Electric. They're, they were a first, the first couple of our customers. Um, and it's been used across lots of different industries. Before I tell you more about what it is, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what GE's been using it for. I always like to start with kind of a, a bit of a case study. Uh, I guess it, there's a little video there I'll play, but at General Electric, um, 10 years, going back 10 years, uh, the company was run by audit. If you wanted, if you wanted to be a, a general manager at General Electric, the path to being a general manager was through finance and through audit. Um, Ten years ago, uh, Jeff M. Elt looked at that and said, our, you know, our company is run by a bunch of auditors. Um, you know, we don't really have much of, by the way, of customer in the fabric of our business. And so we introduced a, a program called ECLP, the, the uh, Experienced Commercial Leadership Program, with the objective of bringing more customer into the decision-making process at GE. Uh, they hired Beth Comstock. Uh, she's, she's been growing the marketing function. I think they have 5,000 marketers now at General Electric. Um, and so uh, I watched Beth Comstock do a presentation at the BMA two, almost three years, two and a half years ago. And uh, I was excited about her presentation because Beth's presentation was about the gold standard of marketing. So only like GE can, they, they identified every process that a marketer is involved in, every single one of them. So you, I mean, from pricing to you know, all the innovation stuff to communication, so on, so every process. There was, a, there was a long list, there must have been 30 things, 30 different processes. And they had searched the world over for what is the gold standard approach in each of those processes. And she, and she gave a speech about that, about their journey of doing that, about which processes they thought were gold standard, you know, what was the approach to the process, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so I was, you know, really looking forward to, to hearing her. And so she gave this presentation, um, and it was great. But when she got done, the, the part that I was interested in is, is how does GE work with its customers to understand if it's doing well? You know, what is the latest and greatest approach to understand from your customer, does your customer really appreciate what you're doing? Is it net promoter score? Is it, you know, what is it? Uh, you know, how do you, how do you literally work with your customer to understand if you are in fact solving their problems? How do you work with your customer to understand if the pace of innovation is right and, and you're solving problems going forward at the right pace? You know, how, what is it that you're using to sort of measure that? And uh, she looked at me and she was just stunned. I mean, she, 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 she didn't have a good answer. Uh, it turns out that GE was searching the world over for what is the best, best method for understanding whether or not you are doing a good job with your customer. Uh, uh, it turns out we presented a little bit later that day. She saw what we were doing, uh, uh, this DVP stuff, which I'm gonna mention here in a minute, and we've been uh, working together ever since. Uh, I'm going to play just a short, I'll see if this works. It's about who has better products, who has the best customer value proposition, and that's where I always want to make sure we, we don't kid ourselves, that we, that we are investing enough, that we know where we stand versus competition. So part of it is just about tools, investment, benchmarking, knowing where we stand. A question for you also, Lorenzo, around something we've 
were calling DDP, differentiated value proposition. You guys have been a great role model on this over the past year, taking a new process that basically says, how do we align what we do to the way our customers make money? And you've taken it to your customers and had incredible insights. Can you talk a little bit about what you've learned in getting closer to your customer and how you think this could apply? Yeah, we've definitely benefited from being one of the pilots for the differential value proposition of DDP. I think what it changes is you're able to listen to your customers a lot more acutely. You're able to say, how do we help you be profitable? How do we help you be better? And it's different than the MPS. It really gets into a different aspect of how we're helping them generate benefit for their customers. DDP is a way to really articulate analytically how you get close to your customer. And they're very supportive. You know, they look at these locomotives, they look at the software, and it's a huge way of showing how our employees are contributing to that. They've been strong advocates, and we think actually there's a lot more we can do with DDP as we go forward with the other customer base as well. So it's a great way to show how GE works uh, for, for the customer. It's about who has better products, who has the best customer value proposition. Enough of the commercial. Um, all, all I'm trying to get across to you is that now's the time for B2B marketers. There's a reason for that, and I think the reason is because the speed of business and the need for more connections to customer that marketing is going to fill. Uh, there, are, there are some very high-level people in corporations that think that matters. You just saw that was Jeff Emelt, for those of you that don't know, uh, Beth Comstock, uh, in one of the presidents of one of their big businesses. Uh, so the stuff matters, there's a great opportunity. Uh, I'm gonna segue now and tell you a little bit about what we're doing with DVP, not to, and I hope not to sell you, but just to share with you a little bit of the work that's going on in the world. Um, I have an Owens Corning case study as well, which is, is fantastic. Uh, just for the sake of time, I'm gonna skip it. Um, and tell you what, what DVP is. Um, so I, I was like you, I, I led sales and marketing for a big corporation. Um, I've done more segmentation than you can shake a stick at. I've you know, been in consulting, worked with some great companies. Um, and here, here is my point of view or my philosophy. Uh, too many of us look at our customer through the lens of our own profitability. And that picture right there is that picture. You know, the good customers, the customers that we make the more money with. Uh, and that's a point of view. My perspective is, is that there's, you know, sort of two sides to every relationship. There's, do you make money with your customer? And does your customer make money with you? I'm, a, I'm a, a decision theory uh, sort of zealot. Um, I follow Dr. Kahneman, uh, who invented behavioral economics. Uh, and Dr. Kahneman has proved that too many of our decisions are made from an inside out perspective. And that inside out perspective would be our own profitability. And that if we would take the time to have more of our decisions made from an outside-in data perspective, meaning our customer's perspective, the corporations would be better off. He won the Nobel Prize for that. He didn't, it's not, it's not a theory that he wrote a book about. Dr. Kahneman, as a psychologist, was the first ever recipient of the economics Nobel Prize as a psychologist. And he won it, in large part, based on those simple pictures I'm showing you, that it's very important to understand the other person's point of view. We, we use that sort of philosophy and have built a system around it to one, understand the customer's point of view on whether or not they're making money with a company, and two, then trying to figure out how to improve and grow that. I said we had a metric, I'll cover that with you. We have a method, probably the most significant contribution we've made is not a metric or a method, but is building tools around that that marketers can use. So let me talk about the metric 
Um, and before I get deep into this, to me, when I think about B2B marketing, it's so much about speed, right? Data and structure of that data. Um, I, was, I was meeting with uh, uh, the chairman of the Illinois Technology Association just yesterday. Um, and he looked at our business, he said, what your business is, is, is the early beginnings of big data when it comes to customers in B2B. And so when you think about data in B2B, you have to have a way to structure that data, you have to have a way to frame up that data in order to get something out of it. And so when I look at this picture, to me, I just see a, a framework and a structure to organize data. And so let me tell you what it is. Um, On the far left is a simple bar graph that adds up to 100 points. It's a company's point of view on what its value proposition is and why it's differentiated. I call those, you can see that thing in there, it says product offering. I call the elements of that the attributes. Uh, those are the investments that a company makes that are differentiated relative to its competitors. All right. So in that particular picture, it says product offering, logistics, and brand. What that picture suggests is those are the three things, as an example, that this company does that are truly differentiated from its competitors that allow its customers to make money with them. Okay? Because of my product, because it's unique relative to any other offerings, it allows my customer to sell more than they would have otherwise. Right? So we do that from an internal perspective, meaning what does a company really think its value proposition is and why it's differentiated relative to competitors. All right? The next bar, it says current. Uh, uh, we work with companies, teach them how to better interact with their customers to understand from their customer's perspective what that picture really looks like. Is it in fact your product that helps our business? Is it in fact your logistics that helps our business? All right, and put that perspective together. The next one is we call opportunity, which is okay, if you're helping me solve problems today because of your product and because of your list logistics, if it were, and I'm talking from the customer's perspective, if it were my billion dollars, how would I have you spend that in order to help me solve more problems in the future? So that's the opportunity bar. Would I have you spend that million dollars in product? Would I have you spend the million dollars in service? How would I have you spend it? And finally, the fourth bar is the plan. Meaning, okay, I know where I'm at from my customer's perspective. I know what they think I, can, they, I, know what they think I should improve. You know, when I think about those two things together, what are we in fact going to do? All right. So when I look at those four bars, when I look at those attributes, all it, all it really is is a structured way to manage data. Manage data about what does my or own organization think about our value proposition, right? In the context of our investments and attributes, what do my customers think really helps their business, creates value for them? What do my customers think I should work on? Where should I make my next investments? It's a data structure. The top bar is the metric. Uh, it's called the DVP percent. Um, so it's, it's a way of metricing your value proposition. Um, I'm a, uh, I've, I've, I've beaten my head against value propositions most of my career. You know, I know I'm supposed to have one. How do I measure it? How do I know if I have one? Uh, I've had CEOs say, hey, what's the value proposition for this? What's the value proposition for that? Is someone going to really buy it? And I'm always like, I, I don't, you know, I'm not sure. So anyway, this is a, a metric that's aimed at actually measuring the value proposition, and here's how it works. If we're doing a billion dollars of business together, I'm the supplier and you're the customer, you chose me for a reason. You chose me as a supplier because you think I can help your business. I mean, that's, there's just, there's honest business, you know, happen, happening there. Uh, the question is, am I? You know, after we're doing business together for a year or two, am I really helping your business? If we're doing a million dollars of business together and I can help drop $40,000 to your operating income line, that's $40,000 divided by a million, that's 4%. That's what that top number is up there, that 4%. It's a, it's a measure of, am I really helping you make money? Right? Because in B2B, that's what it's about. It's not so, it, yes, relationships are important. Um, uh, but what's really important, what really stands the test of time is, is, is as a supplier, if I can help you make money, Right, because uh, whatever it is I'm doing because of product, service, solutions, uh, you name it, if I can help you make money, then I start to understand what my value proposition is. Okay. So we do that 
from an internal perspective, we do it from a customer's perspective, both in the current and future dimension. One of the most powerful metrics that we use at GE and others is not even the what is my value proposition today, but how much improvement is, how much improvement room is there to improve that value proposition from my customer's perspective? Do my customers see a significant roadmap to improve or not? Okay. I'm not gonna, before I go on, you guys are, it's awfully quiet, I'm not really asking questions. Who, who, who has any idea what I just talked, what I just said there? Who has a question? Come on, it's a small group. Give me a question. Go ahead. This is, uh, I like the idea of your metric, but it seems to be only applying to current customers. And if you ask a customer a question on how you are to make money, if you are already a current provider, then only get a reference point. So how do you, how do you account for that? How do you measure the opportunity? Yeah, um, it's a great question. Um, the question was, it seems to only apply to current customers, and if you are a current customer, what's your reference point? Um, first, usually this work is done with your existing customers, and the fastest path to benefit is to increase your share with those customers and get into a better innovation loop with them. Uh, what it is being used, though, is, is you can imagine once you have this database, just think about this, think about sitting behind that simple picture are a thousand customers that have input all this data into that picture that says, you thought your value proposition was X. This, these markets or these different segments think it is Y, and it's worth this much to this segment, not much to another segment. To be able to use that data then to say, okay, we're going to the next, next new customer. You know, do we have an idea about what segment we think they fit in? And based on all we've learned about how customers value us, let's have a conversation with them about why or why not they shouldn't receive this value. So, and so instead of selling them, Right, we're more sharing with them about what others are getting and why why they should or may not be getting that. Okay, so it is used with new customers a fair amount. In terms of the reference point, um, uh, if you're the sole source or the sole provider to a customer, right? Sometimes the reference point is them doing something on their own as opposed to using you as a as a as a as a, as a supplier. Most of the time, you know, customers have more than one supplier and they, you know, they're using one supplier versus another as the reference point. Okay, other questions? It's quiet. Go. Sure. Yes. Yep. Saving money, it's, 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 it's both top line and, 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 you know, it's revenue, cost, both leading to profit, right? So. Uh, I'm doing a lot of work in healthcare right now, and in healthcare, it's it's not about top line so much. It's all about how do you make that business system more efficient, right? But it's still money dropping to the bottom line for a, from a hospital's perspective. Okay. Um, when I think about that model I just showed you, we think about it sort of being applied in three three contexts. The first context is just generating internal alignment, right? I'd like, to, gen I'd like to, to use the structure, the data structure, to first drive internal alignment. It's important that my operations folks, my logistics folks, my sales folks, my, my finance folks have a common view about what we represent as a company, what is our value proposition, so that we don't fight about what is most valuable with the customer. So when it comes to capital, resource planning, that we have a common view about what it is that we do, why we're doing it, and why that's helping our customer, okay? First is internal alignment, that helps with speed. The second is, let's make sure we understand from the customer's perspective, their point of view, both in terms of, do they agree with us on the current dimension, and what are the opportunities in the future dimension? We use that information to improve our innovation cycles, Right, to increase speed of innovation by, by connecting marketing to the customer. We use that information it was just that, to win new deals, right? to be smarter about what is it this marketplace is really valuing about us, leveraging that data to sell the next new customers. We use that in deal preparation. Right? If, if I'm a, a GE and I have a, 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 you know, a, a deal for 100 engines at Delta, you know, we use this information significantly in, in, uh, in deal preparation. 
And finally, I think about it in the context of promise management. Uh, one of the most difficult things, when, I think especially when you're in marketing, is, is the, just the concept of execution. Uh, marketing hasn't been so involved in execution heretofore, and that's changing. Marketing is and will play a, a larger and larger role in the execution of customer-driven initiatives in the future, right? And you, I would just ask you to, to think about that deeply because it's happening. You're going to have more and more direct ownership of initiatives that are fed and led by your customers to have responsibility internally within your organization to ensure that those initiatives are followed up, tracked, completed, and communicated back to the customer. Look, I, I'm not going to, I'm not, like I said, I'm not here to sell you anything. I'm here to just share a few things. Um, our, our, our role, what I work on, um, if you go back, if you uncover, if you lift up the top, the roof of my office in Chicago, two thirds of my people are software engineers and one third are service providers. We're not a consulting company. We're, we're, a, we're a tools, a software company. Um, my point of view in B2B is most B2B budgets, most B2B companies don't have appetite for consultants. They use them, they do little projects, but what, what is needed in B2B are tools to elevate the competence of marketing, okay? I asked uh, Ralph Oliva, who's the, the chairman of the ISPM, five years ago when I started doing this, I said, I don't know, Ralph. I don't know if B2B is really ready to start using these kinds of tools. And he said, Jerry, just do it. So I have. Um, but um, um, I would just suggest to you that as a B2B marketer, you should be curious to find new and interesting ways to leverage tools in, in, the, in the current world that can help you manage data for the purpose of doing real work with customers, meaning helping your company understand how it can increase share, helping your company understand how to win that next new customer. You should be curious about that, right? Because there's a lot of data to be, to be gained. Most, most of the data, I, you know, I don't know many of your companies, but most of the data you have now at your company when it comes to the interface between sales and customer, yes, you have some tactical information. You know who the customer is, you know how often they call on them, you know what they actually bought. But, but when it comes to the what does that customer really value, most of your data is anecdotal. It sits anecdotally. Maybe it's, there's a lot of emails. I mean, it's, it's very anecdotal. And you, and you should be curious about are there ways to structure that data, right, so that you can actually use it in a systematic way to improve your companies. You should be curious about that. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there. What's, what's my time? Am, am, am I out of time? Am I too much time? Have I got a lot of time left? Five minutes. So why don't, I'm just going to stop there um, and let you ask some questions. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll give you some real life examples. Um, I'm working with a business right now that's selling uh, pressure and temperature instrumentation around the globe. Um, they're, not, they're knocking it out of the park in Europe uh, and not selling any at all in the United States. And the question is why? Why, why is that? Um, and so we engage DVP just, you know, and I, there's a lot more going on here than I'm, than I'm showing, but we engage TV to try to understand why is that. Uh, <laughs> and it turns out the primary reason was in Europe they were selling direct. In the United States, they were selling through distribution. And it's, and not, not, it's not a negative on the distributor, but the reality was is that the distributor was not taking the same amount of time to explain the user interface of this instrumentation in the U.S. as they were doing directly in Europe. And as a result, the end user fundamentally didn't know how to use the product. 
Okay, so it's 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 specific things like that. Um, um, in healthcare, a company I'm working with has a, a six billion dollar R and D budget to build products. Um, that's what that's what they've been doing. Uh, they've been building products for a very long time. Um, if you if you live in the world of healthcare, healthcare has been all about patient outcomes, and if you can show at the margin benefit as a result of a piece of equipment or a drug, you can you could sell it, and that's just been the way healthcare has worked. And it's but it's changing. The 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 hurdle that you have to get over to get a hospital to buy a piece of equipment or use a new drug has gotten higher. It has, there has to be more marginal benefit. Um, in the last year, I've been working with hospitals trying to understand, okay, so it's harder to sell you equipment, but what is it that we need to be investing in in the future? What, 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 where does the money need to be, need to be spent? What's important to your business? What, you know, what is the, the future supplier look like to you. And for the next 10 or 15 years, the future supplier to them is not gonna look like someone who creates the next increment, be, incremental benefit on a piece of equipment, or even someone that comes up with a marginal benefit on the next drug. It's gonna be someone who helps them with their business system, right? So if you talk to a hospital, it's like, if I had my million dollars, I would invest none of it in product. I would invest all of it in you helping me figure out how to build a better business system. And, and the, the competencies necessary to help them do that are very different than the competencies necessary to build the next product. Right. Um, now you might say, oh, I sort of knew that. But to be able to make that argument, to cause a company to shift $6 billion R&D budget away from product and $6 billion towards building a whole new set of companies to do that takes data and structure. Right? So that's what's going on. Yep. I do. I, I first of all when when you look at that model, I think of the I, I sort of just throw that model up there. I think it's, I, it's sort of what you saw out there is sort of an endpoint model. Yeah. I think of it as a journey of getting there, because uh, it is. Um, I have been with, uh, I was at Canadian Pacific, uh, as they, them act, serving as a customer. Um, I was involved, we, had, we did about 12 interview sessions with them, try, you know, going through this, you know, asking them questions. Are we helping you now? You know, how would you invest the money and organizing all that and putting it into a structure, you know, as you might imagine, right? Um, and the first nine interviews were with, you know, the, the leader of maintenance and this person that ran marketing and so on and so forth. And, and, they, and they weren't, I mean, they were, they were rich conversations. We were getting a lot of good qualitative stuff, not a lot of good quantitative financial stuff. It's like, really, this is what, how do you, you'd have me spend this million dollars, but that's the easy part. Tell me then how that's going to help your business. What is it going to do? Is it going to save two people? Is it going to, uh, and I wasn't getting a lot. Uh, and then I met with the COO. And the COO looked at that and said, That's exact, this is exactly the right conversation. This is the conversation we'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to have. I need to know what this number is for every one of my suppliers. Um, I only tell you that story because one is not every person you'll, you'll talk to can even talk to you from a financial perspective about how it's helping their business, one. Two, sometimes, especially when you're working with procurement, they don't like to share it because they think they're just going to use it to raise prices, right? Um, what, what I found, what, what I have found over the years I've been doing this is it's a journey. Uh, sometimes it's just a matter of talking to the right person. Um, uh, but I will say this, uh, and I write, you know, I wrote, I, ha I wrote a book and I'm just working on another paper now. Um, the truth about business is that pricing is tactical. Um, I, I get it, right? Um, if you, if you boil it down to an individual, individuals study how to purchase better for their whole lives, and individuals study how to price better for their whole lives. But it's very tactical. It's, it's literally how we decide to split the value, right? 
What's not tactical is the investments that we make, the decisions we make about resources. So when I look at a, not to over, when I look at GE, it's a $150 billion company. Uh, they make a lot of decisions about how they deploy resources. They make a lot of decisions about their investments, right? And the question is, is the customer better off having a stronger voice in those decisions or not, right? And if they are, how do they expect that, how do they expect that information to get inside the walls of GE, right? Because it doesn't get there very well through anecdotal conversations with their sales reps. It doesn't. Um, and so my, 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 you might say that's a little Pollyannic, whatever, but that is my perspective. It's like, look it, we're better off as B2B businesses collaborating on the strategic stuff about, I, I, I chose you because you have, I think you could help my business. Are, are you helping us? We, sh we really should both know that, right? And figure out how to improve that, okay? Now, I get, so that, that's the sort of here. Now, tomorrow I'm still gonna come in and kick your ass on price. Because that's gonna happen, and that's great, right? But we also need to, to temper that with a really good layer of, are we working together, collaborating together to improve our lots in life? Because that's important stuff, right? That's how we solve problems together. That's how we win together. You know, the big important stuff is about, we wanna win together so, so you have a new job. And so we create new jobs, and we help our communities, and we do all that stuff. That's the important stuff. Right, uh, and as fast as I say that, I'm still going to hire the best pricer. I'm going to try and take more from me, and you know all that. So I, uh, that takes a while to build um, that sort of understanding between companies. I'll admit. Other questions? Probably just about out of time. Out of time. Thank you very much.